everyone. Welcome to our talk today. Just to let you know, ChatGPT did help us create this, uh, the title of this presentation. So if, if you think it's creative, you know, that's uh, one of the reasons why we're here to talk. So welcome to our talk. Again, uh, my name is JJ Widener. I'm the Director of uh, Cybersecurity Architecture at Kimberly Clark. I just recently promoted this week. Actually, before that, I was working as a data protection architect and uh, work with JD here all the way from Atlanta, Georgia today. So let's give him a big welcome. Yeah, there we go. Thanks, JJ. Um, yeah, my, my name is JD. I'm doing application security, well, previously doing application security for Kimberly Clark. I'm currently a product security architect, um, focusing on innovative technologies and uh, IoT security. Um, I do have a bunch of industry certifications, but um, outside cybersecurity, I do astrophotography and uh, yeah, just watch some sports. All right, so as our agenda here, since we have one microphone, I'm just going to project. Is that good? Can you still hear me? All right, so brief introduction on uh, this session here. Who here has heard of ChatGPT, Generative AI? Who here has heard of the Azure OpenAI service? All right, so if you didn't know. All right, so we're going to talk through some of our challenges that we went through in this process of standing up some Azure OpenAI service. Uh, so that's the, the problem is generative AI is here, right? It's here to stay. Uh, JD, what are some of the problems that you identify quickly on with generative AI? Well, mostly it's on the corporate uh, data protection and uh, corporate data exfiltration. And uh, JJ, you have a background in uh, data protection. What do you think are, are some of the ways that we can um, do? Yeah, so the, the biggest challenge that we've faced and looked at was the inter intellectual property situation, right? What are people prompting the model with? You got to the public open version, and next thing you know, you're prompting uh, some sensitive information, confidential information, possibly intellectual property. So that was one of the big problems. So data protection was, a, I was a big stakeholder on how are we going to get ahead of generative AI and some of the large language models and stuff like that. So the popularity of generative AI exploded. Anybody that was paying attention to the news, you know, November, November 2022, and then January 2023, it just seemed like it exploded. So, JD, can you talk us through like what is on this slide and uh, what this is talking about? Yeah, if you look at the graphics here, um, ChatGPT only took two months to reach 100 million users. And uh, to think that ChatGPT here is the only th only application that is not a social media or a messaging app, that shows how ubiquitous uh, generative AI would be in the future in the next coming months or years or so. Um, yeah. So some of the, the definitions here, just the level said, generative AI, gener uh, they're generative pre-trained transformers, which is what GPT stands for. So they're pre-trained, they're going to respond back with and create content once you prompt it. And then, JD, a brief uh, definition on prompt engineering? Well, prompt engineering is just um, fixing your uh, prompts so that um, you'll get the content that you, that you desire. All right, so one of the other challenges here is it's a new landscape, right? So I'll just let some of these headlines sink in over, you know, this is over a very short span of time that everybody is either having, you know, launching a class action lawsuit because OpenAI, you know, consumed all my private data, or you have workers that are going out and prompting the open internet version of OpenAI with the intellectual property as the Samsung workers did. So it wasn't really a vulnerability in the large language model or chat GPT. It was the unsecure front end of, of OpenAI at that point where they were able to compromise that and uh, be in the middle of the, the prompts being generated and what it was responding back with, uh, with, with Samsung. So some big, big topics here. And, it's here to stay as well, so that's the other big challenge. It's not going to go away. So what do we need to do to get in front of some of the untested water? Some of it, we don't know what the risks are going to be moving forward with some of this, but some of this we do already. We'll talk about some of those here in a little bit. Any, anybody remember uh, Uncle Elon asking everyone to pause generative AI? Yeah. <laughs> yep. So which leads us to the problem. Um, 
JJ, can you talk more about what um, our problem was? I might get on it earlier, the, the prevalence and just how broadly and quickly this is adopted spun everybody's head. I, I had no idea how quickly uh, you would start submitting intellectual property, say if you're creating some type of compound that could be proprietary or uh, copyrighted or maybe not copyrighted, but you're going you're gonna to log a patent for it. You know, so you're, you're submitting all this information to an unknown SaaS application on the internet. What, where is that going? You know, what's being done? Uh, there's also the concern of uh, memorization with chat GPT, you know, and just GPT models and large language models. So GPT-2 models, uh, some researchers found 5% memorization. With the GPT-4 models, researchers have found up to 20% possible memorization of information that's prompted to the model as well. Yep. And our CISO um, always tells us the toothpaste is already out of the tube with generative AI. It's here to stay. So well, we better just, um, yeah, make do with it. Yeah, adapt. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so with the problem of you know, it's out there and it's publicly available, anybody can log into ChatGPT, create an account, start sending anything to it, you know. So one of the challenges there is who is going out to that public model? Well, when Microsoft bought OpenAI, if you didn't know that, Microsoft purchased OpenAI for a lot of money back in early 2023. And next thing you know, they're, they're packaging it and selling it as a service, right, in Azure. So the Azure OpenAI service, you can utilize to spin up your own ChatGPT model. There's a lot of publicly known assurances from Microsoft that they are not training their models on your data, you know, so a lot of assurances, right? So that's what Microsoft says. I'm still, we're still learning, right? As, as this comes out and Microsoft owns the model, right? You're, you're paying for a service to utilize their model. So we thought that was still much better than employees going out to the public internet and using the open internet version of ChatGPT. So that's why the decision was made. How quickly could we spin up an Azure OpenAI service for ChatGPT. Has anybody else here actually spun one of those up yet? All right, so it's fairly simple to do. You have an Azure subscription, you, you log a request, and you can request it. So uh, it, it allows for additional Azure kind of Microsoft security controls. None of this here is you know, proprietary. This is all Microsoft's website on how you should secure uh, you know, your Azure OpenAI instance. You can put on private endpoints for any storage service that's uh, attached to it. You know, I, I put acceptable use language here because we, we created acceptable use language because uh, the, the messaging before is don't don't put anything that's confidential or sensitive into the public model. You know, social. You know, it's kind of like think before you, you do this to the employees, but we had to come up with the, our own internal acceptable use on how we actually going to use the Azure OpenAI service. Uh, other security controls uh, are customer managed keys, putting in the CMK and any storage service if you're wanting to kind of see how prompts and responses are handled by uh, the Azure OpenAI service, you can log those into a data store, blob, Cosmo DB, whatever, uh, and you can actually use the CMK to uh, customer managed key to double encrypt so it's not using the Microsoft platform managed key. But those are just Microsoft known, you know, security controls. But this next piece, uh, JD, can you talk us through the pre-prompt and the prompt engineering and the rest of these bullets? Yeah, so we briefly talked about pre-prompt and prompt engineering a while ago. Um, but I'll, I'll discuss it in the next slide. Um, moving on to the IP address restrictions. This is tied to the uh, private endpoint and uh, single sign-on. Um, but you can use IP address restrictions to um, restrict access to the public chat GPT in favor of the internal uh, chat GPT platform that you have set up within your environment. Um, logging prompts and responses would help uh, greatly um, monitoring what your employees are sending out in the public. Of course, that's debatable, but... Um, it would also help um, in threat intelligence and analytics from your end uh, when, when your team is doing research and those kind of things. Um, obviously, all the APIs should be documented. Uh, you know which applications are accessing which APIs so that when it comes to troubleshooting, it's easier for you to do. And lastly, there is still no known um, way to um, do a penetration test 
for generative AI. It's all over the place right now, but we can do a sanity check uh, just to make sure, sorry, oh, <laughs> just to make sure that um, we have been um, doing our due diligence when uh, we're setting up our own front end in your uh, generative AI. Yeah. Yeah, some questions for sure. Can you just give some examples of what the sim can do with uh, logs from chat GPT instances? Yeah, so there, there is a, some API logging capabilities with the Azure OpenAI service that Microsoft put on there, right? But how, how can it be utilized to detect maybe abuse? Uh, so if there's a, a large amount of calls being made to it that's an abnormal size, you know, either size or um, just multiple calls in a row, uh, the operational metrics are probably more of interest to the, the IT ops people uh, from what you can monitor to how much is being used so you can track usage of it. So how that could be uh, kind of altered, you know, just altered to understand how it could be abused. Uh, I would say maybe peaks in, in usage and peaks in, in requests and prompts as well. But yeah, so there's some uh, links at the end of this uh, presentation as well that, that goes to like Microsoft's recommended logs that you could capture off of that. But good question though, because it's something that I had to think through and that right now there's not really good logs from the service to yeah. tell you like how can it be abused, yep. so. Yep, so, so for prompt engineering, this is a buzzword for generative AI right now, uh, along with AI hallucination. So when it comes to prompt engineering, it's, uh, it all boils down to specificity. Um, basically, you have to be more specific with your prompts to get the actual answers or the actual um, yeah, data that you want from the uh, chat GPT uh, platforms. So for the more discerning users, um, they would tend to do jailbreaks. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Dan, uh, do anything now uh, prompts. So um, those tend to uh, extend the, the uh, capabilities of these generative AI platforms. Um, however, we thought of some controls um, against these jailbreaking um, prompts. Um, basically, uh, we can use uh, cross-site scripting analogy since I have a, an application security background. Um, if you think of the model or the generative AI model as your application, what you can do is uh, first um, do an input validation. Usually that is uh, done using pre-prompts, um, but um, those pre-prompts are very um, limiting. Um, the last thing you could do is do uh, some output sanitation on your front end for your users so that uh, whenever they, um, they do some jailbreaks, yes, the, the applications or the generative AI has been jailbroken, but you're outputting a sanitized version of what you don't want them to see. So this is um, like a very simplified model of what we had uh, um, running, or well, we, we thought as a setup, a probable setup. Um, the left here is uh, the OpenAI public chat GPT. The right portion here um, would have the private Azure instance that would host the front end uh, that is connecting to the Azure OpenAI service. But we have uh, some of the controls that we can put in place, like the CMKs, as JJ mentioned, the custom pre-prompts and the logging mechanisms uh, connected to the Azure instance, the private Azure instance. Yeah, so those custom pre-prompts are submitted anytime a user submits so behind the scenes, it's submitting, uh, I, I believe it was over uh, a, thousand, a thousand characters long on just how much guardrails we would give it. Like you must not respond with anything that could be business confidential or intellectual property. So if you prompt the model with you know, a trade secret question, it will say, I can't respond back with any trade secrets. So there's a, whole, there's a bunch of other pre-prompts that you can build just to give it more guardrails. All right, so some of the common gaps that, uh, that we've identified with using the Azure OpenAI service right now, the 3.5 model is the only model that's available, at least to, to us right now. So, and then once you switch over to the 4.0 model, the 4 model, the costs go, uh, go up. It, it's extremely inexpensive to do this in your environment as well. We didn't talk about that much, but 
I want to say first couple months like three hundred three hundred dollars. Uh, so not not that expensive. So uh, what are some of the other limitations, uh, JD? Well, obviously, when you have just access to the 3.5, you have the data training model trained like two years ago, and it, it has a cutoff there. So um, it might not be the most updated, but uh, as you mentioned, um, that's a, one of the best uh, ways to implement. Um, yeah. That model is, uh, is highly vulnerable to the Dan attack. So if you haven't, I thought it was pretty cool. I haven't seen it really work until somebody uh, executed on the, the instance that we spun up. So it was able to respond back with ransomware code uh, and able to kind of create a hyperlink as well to a code. Um, so it, it was very impressive on how they were able to, to get that done. Of course, it's a team effort. Uh, it's not just cybersecurity. <laughs> um, everyone um, should be involved, including legal. Um, but um, usually, when we have like, like a large team or IT team or, or organization, uh, there are a lot of different moving uh, parts in there. Um, cloud security, cloud um, infrastructure, um, innovation team, and the data and AI model or AI team uh, would need to be involved as well. Yeah, a lot of stakeholders yeah. wanted to be involved with the language we were projecting, what are we doing with it, what's being generated, what can we copyright, what, what can we can. People are wanting to start you know, laying down patents and stuff that we're generating with, uh, you know, with generative AI. It's like, well, we, can't, we don't even know what that means yet. So, yeah, it's great to have a lot of stakeholders. Legal is, your, uh, is one of your big partners in this one. All right. I think the human component of it uh, boils down to your company or corporation's um, basic strategy regarding generative AI. Um, the first step is to know what your position is or your company's position is um, on generative AI, whether you're already ready to adopt uh, those generative AI models or you might need to uh, take some time and evaluate um, if you have you can implement the necessary controls um, to implement uh, within the um, model. Yeah, and so almost immediately, I think it was April, we, we had a, a training that was able to go out where we included generative AI training with our awareness training. So we were able to get at least some messaging out there on think before you prompt, you know, however you word it, however you frame it, you know, it's think before you click, think before you post, think before, you know, always think. So don't just go out there and submit, you know, your 40 page, you know, super secret document that you wanted to summarize, you know, probably not the best use. So we still have some, some guardrails, some controls on, like how are you wanting to use this? Now, what's the use case? Uh, just so we can kind of get ahead of those challenges that, that we've heard about and we, you know, of course nobody wants to be in a headline anywhere, so. Uh, and you know, that risk evaluation, like what's, what's more risky? Somebody going out to the public model or having your own internal model and somebody using confidential and sensitive data internally where you can control who has access, you can kind of see what's being prompted in the responses, right? So, again, uh, depends on your organization's risk aspect. As JJ always mentioned, always include human in the loop whenever evaluating um, those um, generative AI models. If anybody, has anybody really used a, a whole bunch of ChatGPT, like writing all your papers for college and stuff? No, I'm joking. Uh, but I mean, a lot of that stuff that spits out is junk, right? I don't know if you, some of it's good, right? I use it as a search, search tool, but some of it can be just flat junk, so you gotta make right. sure you really Vet it before you send it off as truth. You know, don't don't have it write something and then not read it because that would be bad. Uh, but yeah, always human in the loop. That's that's one of the AI just kind of responsible uh, usages of AI is always have a human in the loop as well. Yeah. So again, you know, summarizing. You got you got to work as this does together with your organization. This is not something that we just blindly went out and started implementing. There are a lot of stakeholders. So, but you need to have that direction. What's the direction your organization wants to take with generative AI? And hopefully they've been having those conversations because it's not going anywhere. Um, JB, do you have any other closing thoughts? Well, yeah, generative AI is here to stay. So we, it, we, it's up to us to figure out uh, what to do next um, and uh, what um, to implement uh, in terms of controls, security controls.
It, it was a lot of fun too, just being on the kind of the cutting edge and getting this rolled out and stood up. So we have a place where people can go internally and, and use uh, ChatGPT. So again, much safer than, in my perspective, than going out to the public version. Yeah, and it, it's always fun to explore new stuff. Um, if you if you have a background in security, you know that it's a rehash of almost uh, all the other uh, types of security there, like um, application security, network security. So when, when it gets gets repetitive, so when it, whenever you get new opportunities to work on um, newer technologies, it's always fun. All right. Uh, any any questions? We have some links here. We'll, we'll feel free. I mean, we can share this uh, this presentation if you have questions or if you would like it. Um, also, another thing I was going to mention, and I just lost it, uh, so I, I'm not going to say that. I totally just <laughs> exited my head. So yeah, uh, yeah. any questions out there? Yes. So you've got this protective, protective system about what intellectual property is in with chat GPT queries. How do you enforce that beyond, like, if an employee goes home, and tries to search and inputs proprietary data in their own rig on their own internet connection. What yeah. happens there? I mean, it's a good question. It's like how do you prevent people from taking exfilling the data? You know, if I mean, it, it, I can see where it's effective in that it, it makes it harder. You have to be more deliberate versus being in the office and then having access to a you know file share or something and dumping mass amounts of of proprietary information, but it's still, it's still easy enough to do. Well, I think that only comes with the, uh, the administrator's control, right? For the awareness training and for the policy You just have to drill it into people's heads. Yeah. 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 That would be my recommendation is get ahead of that from, uh, you know, from your cybersecurity awareness and education yeah. policy. Acceptable use, right? Uh, I would so that's really the only angle of awareness kind of. Well, there, there are two technical controls. Probably uh, one is the USB um, prevent preventing USB access to the corporate laptops. Yep, and the other is uh, when you, they're accessing the ChatGPT public in their corporate laptops, they can implement browser isolation, preventing copy paste of the information within the actual corporate laptop. But when it comes to the outside, it's kind of hard to. Yeah. Very hard to. Just a question back there. So the, the initial innovation team that helped spin this up, that was like, how are people even wanting to use it? You know, it's usually like translating documents of all the things, right? So that, that's been the highest use case. I want to just translate this into a different language if you have an international organization. So, uh, but yes, there, there is a way that you can do that if you, if you spin up your own front end that you can capture whatever it goes to and back. So there is that capability if, if that's what your organization chooses to do. And then you can analyze that. How are they using it? You know, what are the use cases? Did you have a question, sir? I saw you are going to come up with more tools. I was just related to the, oh, okay. the, the controls. Um, you know, you've got by policy and acceptable use, but I was also going to say, you know, any devices under management by the enterprise can, you know, force yeah. Yeah. remote access to whether that's always on VPN or... Yeah, so another thing is how are you labeling your data? How are you getting, you know, how, are, how is that data labeled in your environment so you can easily detect when that exfil happens? And the, but that's not like generative AI or chat GPT related. That's just in general, how do you, how do you prevent that? Mm -hmm. data mm -hmm. so, uh, a whole bunch more memes, so everybody loves memes. Uh, and I think that's our talk. So thank you everyone for coming. That's at our time.